Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Have you ever been in a company, working in a company where everybody felt alive, they were on task and mission and purpose, people were happy, and things just felt good working there? And contrasting, have you ever been to a company or working with a company where people were down, the morale was low, and maybe not everybody, but certain people were bringing everyone else down? And maybe the companies were in the same industry. You know, you've you've had a career where you've spanned many years and you've seen two different companies that do almost the same thing and the culture was totally different. Well, there's a reason for this. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's podcast. Mm. Well, and I think, you know, we've talked about company culture before and how culture is so important. But I think what we're really going to focus in on is a model for how to get that desired culture and then how to make sure that everybody is basically on board with morale. And if they're not, how do you put them on a trajectory where they can catch up to everybody else? So we really want to go into a model that we think is particularly helpful. And that is the model that was called from the book Tribal Leadership. Now, Tribal Leadership is written by um, Dave Logan, John King, and Haley Fisher-Wright. And we had Dave Logan when we hosted a TEDx in Las Vegas a few years ago. Dave Logan was one of our speakers, so we got to meet him. And he's a really interesting guy with a lot of interesting ideas. And I've really always appreciated this concept that was brought out, or the concepts that were brought out in tribal leadership. And in particular, these um, this com- concept of how do we get everybody to the same level? How do we make it so that say a department, which most of us, if we've done office jobs, have been like in a department. And there's like that really super happy guy and he's great and everybody loves being around him and he's always keeping morale up. And then there's that like one person, that Debbie Downer, who like no matter what they're doing, it's always, you know, (laughs) or no matter what has been implemented in the department, it's always the wrong thing. And how do we make it so that everybody is on the same level of morale and then pushing forward? And I think tribal leadership is one of the best models that I've seen to not only, you know, figure that out, have an instrument to figure out what's going on there, but then also to have an action plan of how to get people to the to higher levels. Yeah, what I love about this model is when when I learned it and started looking at this model, all models start becoming the lens I see life and business and relationships and everything through because it gives you a framework to hang concepts on. It gives you a framework to understand where people are coming from and truly understand where they're coming from and not just rely on stereotypes and overarching, you know, generalizations. And this this piggybacks off a previous podcast about personality ergonomics in the work, workplace. This is part of that piece, I think. Not only do you want to have people that are in jobs that are that are designed for their personality, but we also want to have everybody on the same, I guess, this idea of tribal leadership, and we're going to unpack this in a moment, but the same vision of what we're trying to accomplish together. You know, if we're building teams of people or tribes of people, as this book posits, we're going to want to all be on the same page to accomplish the goal we're doing as a collective group of people. And so this plays into that idea of ergonomic design as well, I think. Yeah, totally. So a a big A big component of it that we'll probably be using this phrase multiple times through this podcast is getting the right people on the bus and in the right seats. That's a that's a major piece. And I think, like you mentioned, that previous podcast on ergonomics, personality ergonomics, that's a lot about getting people in the right seats on the bus. And I I think when it comes to business, you can't underestimate the importance of hiring and making sure that your employees feel good about where they're at. And if you are an employee, it's really, I I believe that relationships, all relationships, including an employer-employee relationship, is a two-way street. So in the past, when I've gone into job interviews, I feel like I'm interviewing them too, because I need to know if this is the place that I want to be spending a portion of my life at, regardless of whether or not I'm getting a paycheck. And so these ideas around personality ergonomics and tribal leadership that we're gonna we're about to launch into, all of it is, uh, you know, these are ways to determine, or kind of figure out, they give you instruments to kind of figure out and calibrate to higher levels of happiness and making sure that the environment you're in is conducive to that happiness. Absolutely. So this, this, is, this model we're going to talk about is taken from the book Tribal Leadership. It's the five stages of culture models. So there's five levels. So if you want to take notes, feel free to grab a piece of paper and, you know, make some some lines because we're going to go straight up from the bottom to the top, starting with level one all the way to level five, and just give you some, you know, some frameworks around each of these levels. Before we launch into the five levels, though, the overarching concept of tribal leadership is that 
when we when we can as humans we are naturally driven to create tribes we love creating tribes of people whether it's in the workplace or whether it's a religion or it's a special interest group or whatever it is we love tribes and the way that the book dis- defines a tribe is anything that is basically between 20 and 150 people if you have less than 20 people, they call that a team as opposed to a tribe. And if you have over 150 people, I believe that the tribe starts to break down and it oftentimes shifts into two different tribes. So generally when you have over 150 people, that's unmanageable for a single tribe and then it will generally break off into two separate tribes. But anywhere between 20 and 150 150 people is a tribe. And you can really tell what makes a tribe successful based on its culture. So the culture of a tribe is incredibly important. And what's really fascinating about tribes is that they are almost always more powerful than leadership. So the leadership plays a role in influencing the tribe, but fundamentally and ultimately, the tribe is going to be the real power monger. And the culture of that tribe will ultimately be the power monger as well. So the the big prevailing concept is we've got tribes. Tribes are between 20 and 150 people. The culture culture of the tribe is incredibly important for predicting its success. And if you want to change the culture, you change the words or the language that is spoken within the culture. So the culture of a tribe is all about, and, and the book really goes into it, it's all about stories, narratives, stories, how we we believe we're communicating with each other within this tribe, like you know, like uh, uh, a lot of companies now are really focused in on their creation story. Like how did the company start? And they'll talk about that story over and over again. That's because that's the story of the tribe. And so how our stories evolve, what kind of stories we're telling each other, the language we're using that's wrapped up in these stories, that is going to basically be how you define the level of the culture or the tribe. So level one of the, you know, the tribal leadership model that we're going to go over is basically there's there's vernacular that's used. So it's level one and it's about 2% of any tribe that is built. So out of all the people, about 2% live at this level. Uh, the behavior at this level is very much an undermining behavior. It's a, it's a very down and out, oh, woe is me kind of behavior. Uh, the relationship to people is alienated. And the, the language or the verbiage that's used at this level is life sucks. It's terrible. It sucks. There's nothing worth living for. It's horrible, blah, 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 blah. So this is, this is the vernacular that's used at this level of the first stage of tribal leadership. Yeah, and fortunately, only about 2% of the population is at level one. Uh, the whole model really, you'll see as we go, it's a bell curve with the lowest levels, one being the lowest level is on one side of the bell curve, and then the highest level, stage five, is on the other side. And most people fall someplace in between. So fortunately, there's not a lot of level ones because it's a really kind of crappy place to be. It's this concept that your life sucks, or actually not just your life, but like all of life. Like the universe sucks. Everything sucks. Nothing is going to be good. Uh, and and that's why it has this sort of um, undermining behavior. Because everything is bad and wrong and nothing can be positive or good, anything that's introduced, you're immediately going to be, a a, a one is going to be suspicious of it and assume it's going to lead to just more of the same. It's going to lead to more of the same bad. And so there's a sense of of, uh, undermining anything that could possibly be positive. And you can really see this in, uh, in certain cultures and certain companies and certain I would I would argue government installations. <laughs> uh, the book mentioned you really see this in gangs, right? Gangs have very much a universe sucks mentality. Um, the DMV, they mentioned in the book, the DMV is probably a level one, which is really fascinating. But that's why when you go in, it's like your soul just kind of gets sucked out of you as you're in the DMV. This is the Debbie Downer in any department that everything is bad and wrong and they always can find the negative spin on anything. So this is this is a level one and it's really not where anybody wants to be or stay. Yeah, I mean, you've you've worked with somebody like this at your company or in a job role. You've had somebody around this. God forbid this has been you in a role. 
But you've worked with somebody like this and you just feel awful when they're around. Nothing is positive. So then, of course, the big question becomes, what do you do about somebody like this? Do you just cut them loose? Do you yeah. just fire them? Like, what do you do if somebody is a one? And what's nice about models is it gives you a framework for how to progress people through different levels and stages. And with any model, you can't skip steps, right? That's that's kind of like the fundamental rule of a model. You can't skip steps. You got to go through all of it. So one of the best ways to get people out of one is not to try to graduate them to the highest levels, which we'll be getting to, but rather to just introduce them to level two. And what we can do is we can talk a little bit about level two, and then we'll talk about how to get a, you know somebody who's one to a two. So level two is a bit of a step up from level one. Instead of the universe sucks in this like sort of grand, you know, pessimistic, <laughs> terrible, you know, hostile way. Yeah. It's just that my life sucks. <laughs> Every it's, Everybody else seems to be having a good time of it, <laughs> right? It's like me, I'm the person who's got the terrible situation. My life sucks. So it's a less bleak outlook, right? Lo ones kind of have this idea that everything sucks, so there's no like positivity. But to a two, it's like, oh no, everybody else is okay. It's just me, uh, my life sucks. So instead of being like aggressively undermining, it's more of a victim mentality, right? It's more of sort of like this apathetic, there's nothing I can do, my life sucks, woe is me. And instead of being fully alienated for the, from the rest of the group or the tribe or team, then it's more of separation, right? Like I might be hanging out with you, I might not be trying to undermine everything you guys are doing, but I don't really feel like I'm a part of you. Yeah, it's just kind of coming in, collecting my paycheck, going home, and that's about the, about the extent of my involvement here. And it just, you don't have that passion, that buy-in, that involvement of wanting to see the group or the team or even the company succeed. It's really about you and your job and getting your job done. And that's really all you care about. The, the vision stops about three feet in front of you. Yeah, pretty much. However, this is still a step up from one. All right. One with what that has the bleakness to two, which is just personal bleakness, not like universal bleakness. So one of the best ways to get a one to go to two is, again, the language you're using is extremely important. So instead of, you know, reinforcing this concept that everything is terrible and bleak, you want to encourage the person to see, well, other people's lives don't suck, right? To a one, everything is awful. But if you can introduce them to, to this idea that other people are actually having a good time of it, right? Then they might reframe to go, well, maybe not everything is awful, but my life sucks. Well, that's still not ideal, but it's a step up from one, right? And you can't skip steps. So the person has to graduate from everything is awful to just, oh, my life sucks. Other people are having a good time of it. So if you can expand their territory that they're taking in and help them recognize that there is positivity happening someplace, that actually is a step up. And one of the best ways to do that is to, you know, encourage them to go to group meetings involve them in meetings and have people like, you know, articulate success or good positive stories, keep the language, uh, you know, about things sucking or being negative at a minimum, like you keep the language of the group positive, you make sure that you're fashioning your, your stories in a positive way. So you're not just like telling stories about how lame everything is about, you know, like, oh, well, you know, last quarter, we totally thought we were going to make our numbers, but we didn't, right? Like, spinning narratives and stories to be positive, right, is a big thing. And then, of course, encouraging those people, the ones, to no longer hang out with other ones, <laughs> right? Like, don't hang out with other people who have, like, just this general sense of malaise and everything is awful. I would, I would suggest that it's going to be very difficult if you're in a company, if you're a team lead, you're in a company, and you have any amount of ones yeah. in the tribal leadership model on your team or that you're working with, it is very difficult to get them out of one into two. There are ways to do it. And probably what's going to end up happening is you're going to have to cut them loose because it's like a bad apple in a bunch. They're going to poison other people. And it's there's so much effort to move them to two. As a company or as a business, why would you want to take all that effort? It might just be better to get somebody at a higher level to come in at that higher level than try to work with the ones you have. However, there might be circumstances where that's needed. And so that's good to have some of these frameworks. But I would, I would guess that you probably are going to want to just start over with somebody else if somebody's at the level one in your business. Yeah, I think you could probably survive with one level one in a team or a group or a tribe and encourage them to go up. But if you've got two, 
now you have a now you have a real problem because they're they're going to want to reinforce each other's worldview. It's going to be very difficult to not have them just continue the language that keeps them in that at that stage. So I you know it, it's probably going to be real difficult to work with somebody like you said at that level. And yeah, it might be that you have to let them go. But like you said, if you can't, if for some reason that is not a possibility, then the the best tool is to separate them from other people that are using the same narratives and language and reintroduce completely new language that helps them understand understand that there is good stuff happening someplace. Now, fortunately, this is a small percentage. Level one is only about 2% of the population, but level two, we start to get a significant amount of the population. 25% of people are about level two in the tribal leadership model. And so we have a lot more people in your business, the team you're on, the company you run that are going to be at the level two that this now we can start talking about, okay, probably level ones you're going to let you're going to just want to cut loose. But level twos, you're probably going to have them in your business or at least on the team you're on. So what do we do with level twos? And what kind of way can we move a level two into the tribal leadership model number level three? Hmm. So three is uh, the highest percentage of the population is at level three, 49% according to the tribal leadership book. So nearly half of everybody that is in the workforce or in different positions are level three. And level three is, it, it's a graduation from my life sucks. Remember one is everything sucks. And then two is my life sucks, but everybody else is great. Level three is I'm great. Everybody else sucks, <laughs> right? Like I'm awesome. I'm really good at my job. I'm Only super. people did it the way I did it. It would be great. Yeah, I'm super competent and capable. Like I'm the per- I'm the only person that knows what's going on around here. How many times have you run into somebody that's like, you and me were the only people who know what's going on around here. Everybody else is an idiot. So it's this it's this idea of like you're awesome and everybody else sucks. So of course the behavior is not apathetic. It's not victimy. It's not undermining. It's more like. Uh, um, I believe the 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 book uses the phrase a lone warrior, right? Like you're the only person, you're that you're that lone scout who knows what's going on, and and everybody else is just messing up. And so you get you get this kind of idea or this relationship with everybody about domination, right? Like you need to you need to think what I'm thinking, you need to do things as I'm doing them, you need to believe what I'm believing because I'm the person who's the expert. We also see a lot of one-to-one relationships pop up at level three. So these, you know, you may have, if you are level three in tribal leadership or you have been this in the past, I mean, we all have, I have in my life, we tend to develop like one-to-one relationships. I might develop that relationship with a person in the purchasing department and they're my inside person that I know they can get me the, the items I need purchased in the purchasing department. So I go to them and I have this. And if the other person's in the purchasing department that day, I might not go in there because I don't have that one-to-one relationship with them. I don't feel like I'm on their team. I feel like I'm on that one person's team that purchases things that I need for my department. So you start seeing these kind of relationships pop up. You know the one or two people you can go to in the different departments and get things done because you're great. And they're the ones that are helping you become great and do the the thing that you know is the most important thing to be done right now. Well, and if you have a colleague, you don't want to share that resource with your colleague because you're trying to be the person who's on top. Like you think of yourself as awesome and you want your resource for yourself. So if you have a colleague that needs somebody in that department and you've got a go-to guy, you will not share your contact with your colleague because that's your guy. Right. So you have a lot of one, like you said, a lot of one-to-one relationships because so many people are at three. I think it's really good to spend a lot of time talking about three. But before we really launch into a full description of three, to get a two up to three, all right, to get a two to get to the point of being a three, again, it's a matter of changing the language. That's very important. And then really helping the level two understand how they do bring something to the table, right? Because you're trying to encourage them to get to the I'm awesome everything else sucks, which again is not ideal, but it's better than my life sucks and everybody else is awesome. So it's a reframe. So a couple things that you do, of course, is you keep your language and the, the narratives and the stories of the tribe positive, and you encourage them to establish those one-to-one relationships. Like you were mentioning that threes do, right? Like go find that resource that's going to like scratch your back and you scratch their back, right? It, that is more, that's more likely going to allow them to experience personal success. And personal success is how you bump somebody up into three. You also can assign them projects that will give them quick success. So you basically stack a a two and prime them and position them to have a lot of little successes and create relationships that will continue those successes. 
the emotion you're trying to encourage a two to have. So if someone's sitting in your company or your team and they're tribal two, which is my life sucks, everybody is awesome. What they're saying is I feel disempowered. I feel like I don't have any power of my life and my life sucks. And so the emotion we're trying to create to get from somebody from two to three is to give them the emotion of empowerment, to feel like they actually can do something in their position. And so, you know, it might not be the highest echelon of development to have those just one-to-one relationships with that that person and the purchasing department person. But what that does, it gives them that sense of empowerment. I can actually get things done. I have that relationship with that person in the purchasing department to get the item or the product I need to do my job better. And now that makes me feel better. It makes me feel empowered, which is the full emotion that we're trying to get them to is to feel like they can make a difference individually in the role they're in. And that starts to move them from two into three. So we already went through an overview of three, talked about how almost 50% of the population is three. They've got this lone warrior mentality. It's all about one-upmanship and being the best in their field and this idea that I'm great and everybody else sucks. And you can really see this in so many different cultures. Even impromptu tribes or these tribes that pop up around special interest groups, not just in companies, you can really see this all over the place. Everybody wants to be the expert. It's all expertitis. Everybody wants to be the person in the know. And they're very quick to let you know how much, you know, how, how much more sophisticated they are than you. You can see this in professional worlds, like doctors, <laughs> lawyers. It, it, I mean, the, the professional industry is filled with threes. And you can really tell because it doesn't really feel like they have a sense of caring or trying to give back to their client or their customer. It's more that they want to show up as the person who's in the know. I was actually thinking just recently, um, we have this program called Mention, and we pay a small amount every month to basically what the what the program does is it finds all the different places that your business has been mentioned and then it collects it and sends it to you so that you have a way of knowing like you know what's the buzz around your business is it good is it bad what's your feedback and uh, there's a uh, on reddit reddit which is a news aggregate site has a subreddit called mbti and a bunch of subreddits under the mbti which is all the different myers-briggs types and personally hacker gets mentioned every once in a while somebody will like post a podcast or they'll talk about you know an article that we've written And, you know, the feedback can be mixed bag. It can be good. It can be bad. But just recently, there was an article that was, it was linked to, and the reception was not thoroughly positive because it was a more technical article. It was a, it was technical concepts written intentionally very simply. And there was this sense of inaccuracy, right? Like, oh, those aren't accurate, right? Like they need to be more flushed out. They need to be more complex or more deep dive. And of course, you know, we do that in other places, but that was not the point of that particular article. You're talking about Reddit linking to one of our articles. Exactly. Yeah. In this subreddit, there was a link to one of our articles and this was the conversation that basically came up around it. And these and the Reddit subgroups are oftentimes very forum like, right? They're they're conversation based as opposed to just simply posting things and then leaving it, you know, leaving it be. There's a lot of conversation that happens around them. And I I really It reminded me of just Myers-Briggs communities in general. Now, I don't know if you as a listener are into Myers-Briggs or if you're into personal development. What you love about our stuff is that it's personal development. It just happens to also include personality typology systems and lots of other models. But one of the first things that I, I decided when we first started this business is that I was actually not going to really go into the Myers-Briggs communities. (laughs) I was like, I don't really think I'm going to go there. And one of the reasons why, and it didn't really strike me until much later, is that the community, not everybody in Myers-Briggs communities is like this, by the way, but a big percentage of the community is tribal three. There's a lot of ambiguity around the technical concepts of, say, cognitive functions, And by ambiguity, I mean, there's nothing that's empirically true. And so it's a lot of test iterate. It's a lot of conversation. It's a lot of trying to figure things out. And because the Myers-Briggs community is mostly made up of people who are relatively disenfranchised, they're intuitives for the most part, they're used to people thinking of them as weirdos. And then they run into this tool of Myers-Briggs, which is incredibly powerful and explains that they're not broken. And so they get, they, they form a fondness for it. They form really a love, I believe, for this model. And 
they go down the rabbit's hole and they voluntarily spend all this time, you know, learning these complexities and and um, really kind of trying to get into the, you know, the deep dive of this, when really it's always just really conceptual. It's like it from even though it rings true, even though everything in our, you know, we have an instinct, those of us who have gone down this journey, we have an instinct that it is true. There's nothing empirical about it. So it's all conversational. And so when we talk about things like things being more or less accurate, we're really kind of patting ourselves on the back about like where our personal perspective falls and what makes the most instinctive or intuitive logic to us as individuals, because there's no real instrument to, you know, to gauge it. And what ends up happening though, is there's a, um, there's a feeling of expertitis that develops. And you can really see how this tribal three mentality you know, basically emerges with people going, well, you're wrong and I'm right all the time, right? No, 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 no. My interpretation is way, way more right than your interpretation. And oh, you're being grossly inaccurate or I wouldn't agree with that at all or whatever it is. And it's because I think there is no actual goal that the community is working toward. It's only, this is how it's impacted me as an individual. This is how I feel about it as it relates back to me. And I've done a lot of study on this, so that I must know what I'm talking about. So I, I find it so interesting that that community is a great example, at least in my mind, of how corporations and businesses create these threes all the time, right? Like a person gets into a position, this company has paid them money, right? So they feel really good about that. They feel like they found something that's positive in their life. They get really good at their job. Maybe they get like a really you know, lots of successes. You know, we talked about twos going to three, give them a lot of small successes. They get a lot of success. They start to think, ah, oh, I really know what I'm doing here. Then they get competitive, right? Because they're going after that position and the other person is going after it too. And, and they maybe they beat them out and they now are the person that's in that position. And now everything's built around competition because there's nothing bigger that they're trying to attain to. There's no bigger goal. There's no like, let's galvanize all of us to achieve something bigger. There's none of that. There's only my expert expertise compared to your expertise. Yeah. It's climbing that corporate ladder or moving up the ranks to become the higher executive someday or whatever. Yeah. And it's amazing how you'll see it in business contexts, in special interest groups, right? I mean, Myers-Briggs is it's the one that's fresh on my mind right now, but it is by no means the only one. I've been in tons of special interest groups where people are constantly trying to like out expertise, you know, expertise other people, or they're trying to be the big man on campus, or they're trying to be the person who's in the know or whatever it is, right? I mean, I use, you see this in gaming, online gaming all the time, <laughs> right? Or you'll see it in, uh, I mean, my, my world is very nerdy and most of my most of my frames of reference are going to be very geeky and that doesn't mean everybody else is going to like, act, you know, be able to resonate with them. But you probably have seen this in special interest groups within your own context. I was just talking to somebody earlier today who's, who is a, uh, a horse wrangler and they have a team of people that were, they work at a stable, a professional stable. I was doing some coaching with this person today and they were having some struggle because everybody that's working at the stable has a tribal three mentality. This idea that I'm great and you suck and and you don't know how to work with horses, but I do. And everybody feels this way. And they can't accomplish the goal of taking people on trail rides because they have infighting around who's the better horsemanship person or who's the better horse wrangler. And so it, it literally pops up in pretty much every tribal configuration you can possibly imagine. And it certainly is better than tribal two, you know, the level two that we were talking about earlier, because at least at this level, People are motivated, they're encouraged to be proactive, they're looking to further their own personal career. But again, it stops with them. It's more about their experience climbing the corporate ladder or showcasing their knowledge or expertise rather than what you talked about, Antonia, which is focused around something bigger than just themselves. Right. So so then the question is, how do you get people out of three? Well, let's let's talk about the fourth stage. Let's talk about stage four. And then we'll talk about ways to encourage people to go from three to four, because most people land at three and stay there for a very long time. And if everybody else is three, then again, remember the language, the narratives, the stories are extremely powerful. And that means that if you're surrounded by other people that are sharing this tribal three language, how are you ever supposed to graduate from it, right? And if 50% of the population is here, or almost 50%, then you're going to be saturated in this kind of language. You're going to be saturated in this competitive mentality. So let's talk a little bit about 
tribal four and then strategies to get people from three to four? Tribal four has a pretty significant percentage as well. Remember, we're looking kind of like at a bell curve here. Tribal four is about 22% of the population is going to be here. And the, the vernacular, the wording really changes from, you know, tribal one was life and the universe sucks. Tribal two is my life sucks. Your life is pretty awesome, but my life sucks. Tribal three is I'm great. And by definition, that must mean that you're not as great as me. You must suck. And the, the language changes when you go from three to four, it goes to we're awesome. We're great. As a team, as a group, as a tribe, we show up and we're awesome. And the other tribes, by definition, suck. So now we're in this together as a tribe, not warring with other tribes, you know, in the old school way of it. But technically, it's that competition nature where you're a part of a business that's growing and you feel like we're the best at this business and we're going to beat that other business across the street feeling. And we're all in it together. Yeah. And so you get a sense of pride around that, right? Like that's you, you really understand the importance of having relationships. The, the book talks about how you go from dyadic relationships, that sort of one-to-one -one relationship that Joel was mentioning before, which is like, that's my resource and you can't share it. Because we're all a team and we're all in it together, we create triads, which is, hey, have you gotten a hold of my guy? <laughs> right? Like, oh, I have a great guy for that. And I'll triad you. I'll introduce you to my great guy. And everybody gets a win-win then because, you know, the guy gets, uh, uh, your colleague gets another resource. And the person who, you know, is the, you know, the guy, the resource gets to expand his you know, his reach, his networking reach. And you're the awesome person because you tied these two people together. So everybody feels really great about these triadic relationships. And and level four tribes are built on triads or, you know, whatever goes beyond a triad. But it's not just, it's not based on competition, internal competition. It's not based on sort of a scarcity mentality and grabby. It's based on an idea of abundance and how we're awesome and we're all really great. Yeah. And it also throws in the idea because you have that pride, nothing is, it, it, it opens this frame to, well, that it's not my technical job, but I'm, I'm prideful around this organization and what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to go ahead and take that on. And something very simple, like you're walking across your corporate campus or through the building and you see a candy wrapper on the floor. At this level, Tribal 4, most likely a Tribal 4 is going to lean down and pick that up and go throw it away because they realize that might be the janitor's job ultimately, but it makes the place look crappy. And you want to have a sense of pride of where you work. And we're all in this together. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick up that piece of trash and throw it away because I care and I want the entire tribe to feel good and be elevated. The rising tide will raise all ships if I can go pick up that candy wrapper. So then how do you get from three to four? How do you go from this, I'm awesome, but everybody else sucks, into we're awesome mentality? And one of the best ways to do that is, well, you can almost see it sort of organically, naturally happen with a lot of threes as they get older. They might create friendships with colleagues that are peers, and they might understand how those, you know, those people, those peers are actually at their same level. Uh, that might be one of the first epiphanies they have. They might just be getting just like a general sense of wanting more out of life and wanting to contribute and give give back. And it's not just all about them. It might just be aging, right? Seasoning, becoming sort of tired of the game. However, again, it's a lot about the language and the language needs to be language of we're awesome. It needs It needs to really be codified. And one of the best ways to create codified language that encourages your threes to go to four, if these are your employees, is to have a bigger ideal that everybody's working towards. And these bigger ideals don't even have to be like a corporate mission. It doesn't have to be like this big grandiose, like this is what we're trying to accomplish. It could just be core values. Now we've talked a lot about core values in the past, how important they are for individuals, how companies that have core values almost always have a culture that is like excelling the company beyond all of their competition. So core values are very important. But what core values does is it creates a language, a story really amongst the tribe where these are the things we stand for. We're going to be in integrity with these core values. We're going to make sure that everything that we do is congruent with who we see ourselves as an identity, as as sort of an organism, as this huge group. Like you said, there's a candy wrapper there. I'm going to go ahead and pick it up. It's not my job, but that's an integrity with our core values, which is maybe excellence or whatever it is. So defining core values, language around core values, stories around core values, right? Like these are all the things that encourages a three to reach out for something bigger than just their own personal, um, you know, competitive experience. 
So a, an example of this, when Steve Jobs had started Apple Computer in the 1970s, he rose very quickly to extreme wealth, extreme fame, and his computers were being sold worldwide. And they started to scale up in a corporate way. So you had corporate people coming on board and it started to become a corporation, no longer just a startup out of some kid's garage. And Steve Jobs was obviously the founder, but he was relegated to the development, the creative development end of things. So Steve Jobs, I believe, realized these principles and he wanted to get his team together to feel empowered and to feel good, not just individually, but as a team. So what he did is he took his creative team, he found a site somewhere in a warehouse off site from Apple's headquarters in Cupertino. They hung a pirate flag outside of their, their little office space that they created for themselves. And they had the slogan, let's be pirates. And it codified his little creative team around, we're in this together, we're awesome, and we're gonna build the next computer that's gonna just revolutionize everything. And we're a team. And he actually, so this, this idea of core values, it was kind of a weird core value. This idea of being a pirate, being somebody like you're on this ship that is gonna do big things in the world. You've literally got a pirate flag hanging outside of your, your offices and you're off site from the rest of the company. And at first glance, that might look very tribal two or three-ish, but I believe that was a tribal four move on him, on his part. He couldn't do that with the whole company. There was too much corporate structure. He wasn't the CEO at the time. He wasn't in charge, but he was in charge of a tiny division that he could take charge of and leadership of and create this idea of a core value and an objective they were going toward in the midst of an even bigger corporation, which I thought was brilliant of him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it it chunked the tribe down, right? It put it into tribal uh, numbers, right? Because um, I don't know how big the corporation was. I don't have the numbers of that either, but yeah, yeah it was but, big. But according to the book, and I think that this actually makes a lot of sense, once you get past 150, you're now splitting off into different tribes. So, or 150 people or more. So it makes sense that if they were working on a project that they really wanted to have an elevated sense of morale, that they would chunk it down into a smaller number and create a tribe around that. And that's really, I think that's one of the reasons why 150 is the cap, because you it's really difficult to manage more than 150 people at any given time, right? And and that's what you need to have in a tribe. You need to have personal relationships, triadic personal relationships with everybody in the tribe. And if you've got so many people that you can't remember people's names anymore, or you can't really like keep up with what's going on in their lives, at least on a very shallow level, like you don't have any relationship with them, then the tribe starts to break down because you don't you don't have relationships. You don't have those triadic relationships where it's like, you know, like we we work together, we are better as a team than individually. And if the numbers are too big, it's really easy to go back to having that separated feeling or that alienated feeling or that personal competitive feeling. So that makes sense to to grab a group and then focus on that tribal group. One of the things with going from three to four is tribal four, from my perspective, is a little bit idealistic. In other words, for a person that is, I'm awesome and I'm moving up the corporate ladder, to put that aside for a moment and play on a bigger team and say, I want the welfare of everyone that I'm involved with on this team to be elevated, it takes a little bit of an ego hit and also a little bit of, and I think even, you know, Dave Logan and the other authors make this point, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith to realize that you're not going to personally lose out by everybody succeeding. Like if the whole team succeeds, that doesn't by definition mean that you now will personally lose out, which is at level three, one of your worst fears is that you're not going to climb the corporate ladder. You're not going to be able to elevate yourself to the next level in your career or position in a group or whatever tribal status you have or want. It takes that leap of faith to realize that the rising tide really will raise all ships and that everybody's success is my success. And if you're listening and you've been in this position where you've had the opportunity to go from three to four, you know what I'm talking about. You know that transition period where, and we've talked a lot about this, you almost let go of the one branch, you're in suspended animation, and you don't know exactly where you're going to land, but you have to have the faith that when you land and you're a team player and you're all in this together, that it's going to be okay. And you're still going to have the success you desire at level three. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think four is really the sweet spot. I think it's where most companies are trying to get to because- it it's doable, right? Most of their most of their employees are going to be threes. And so getting threes up to four is is a very reasonable, I think, goal. And so four is a great place to be. And and you are competitive, but like you said, you're competitive with people outside of your company. You're com you're competing with other companies. And it just makes everybody feel good, right? It's fun. It feels supportive. 
yeah, it's not all about personal, you know, your own personal um, aggrandizement. It's about building something bigger, which you can't do all by yourself. So, you know, if you're if all if you're all about personal competition, then you're only going to be able to build so much because a single resource of any kind is only going to have so much mobility or so much impact. But when you work in a team, you can build, you you know, you have a lot more effective abilities to build something bigger. Another great example of this transition period or two different, you know, between three and four is professional American football. In the NFL, if a individual player is a free agent, they might be really interested in furthering their career and hopping from team to team to team to get the best pay, to be the highest stats and get the ball more, get more play. But a smart player, as they mature, begins to realize that if they align themselves with a team rather than just their individual career mov- movement forward, and they align themselves with a team that's focused on the entire team winning a Super Bowl or winning a championship, well, now they are, by definition, going to be successful because they're part of a bigger group trying to do something better rather than just a free agent that's trying to better themselves. And you can see this. It, you can see the teams where they have a lot of people that are at three, a lot of guys that are at, at Tribal 3 just wanting to further their career versus a lot of people who are at Tribal 4 wanting the team to be successful. It doesn't matter if they get the ball in this one play. It matters that the ball got across the line by somebody on the team and they scored points. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about five because actually five is on the other side of the bell curve. And that means we're back to being a very small percentage of the population. So like level one, there's which only has 2% of the population represented there. Level five only has about 2% of the population. And this... This is where it's not just a we're great, it's life is great, the universe is great, everything is wonderful. It's the sense of like wonderment about what is possible and wonderment about the world. It's such a team feel. It's like everything is amazing and we're all syncopated and it's all just, um, it's going to be incredible. And I remember, I don't remember exactly where I heard this. It was when I was talking about tribal leadership at around the time that Dave Logan came and spoke <laughs> at our TEDx. So I don't remember if it's something he said or something I picked up from somebody else who was talking to him. But I remember there was a story around one of the, you know, CGI animation studios. I don't know if it was DreamWorks or Pixar or it was one of those. And when they were being interviewed by Dave Logan to talk about, you know, who's their competition, and what, that's actually a question Dave Logan was using to try to determine the tribal level of the company. Who's your competition? And the person looked at him, they were a programmer, and they just kind of shrugged and went, hair? <laughs> right? Like, is hair is our competition? <laughs> and trying to animate hair effectively. Yeah, exactly. Like, hair, like that. I think that might be our competition. And And what was great is that that was, at least at the time that he was visiting, that company was at five and it was because they didn't have any competition. They weren't competing with anybody outside of their business. I I believe I remember the book stating this. I I apologize. It's actually been about four years since I read the book. And so um, I'm going based on a lot of uh, of memory of the specifics about the book. I, I just, I remember that the model was amazing. I believe it was the book that indicated that most of the time when you get to tribal five level, it's when a four tribal four business is working on a project. And that's when they peek into five. And it's because most of the time you can't sustain five. Five, the sense of like wonderment and the sense of everything is amazing and we have no competition. It's not a long-term sustainable state for an entire group of people to be in. But you can definitely be there when you've galvanized everybody for a major project. And in, in the moments of the project, there is no competition. There is nothing but just getting this thing done. And then generally when the competition, or excuse me, when the project is over, that's generally when that team that is at, you know, tribal five will rest back into four and go, okay, so what's the other companies in our industry doing, right? They'll they'll start getting interested in what other people are doing and they'll start to ask themselves, you know, what's going on outside in the industry and let's, you know, kind of check in and see what our competition is doing. And then when they choose to do another project, well, then they bump right back up into five. Yeah, you could see this with, you know, medical research, for example, it might start off that medical researchers are 
you know, somebody comes and gets a job at a, a research university like Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh to research some disease and they want to further their career. So they get a great job. They're at Tribal 3. They realize, man, I'm on a great team at this university and I want this entire team to be successful and we need to get more funding than the university down the street. So we're going to do better work than them. So you're competing for funding against this other university and now you're getting more research funding into your department. And then one day you realize our team's working on solving you know, solving the causes of cancer, why are we worried about our individual upward, you know, career ladder? Why are we even worried about competing with the university down the street? Cancer is actually our our enemy here. That's who we're competing against. We're trying to race against cancer. And you see that now it's no longer another tribe you're warring against. It's an idea or a project like you're saying. You've peeked into this place of I realize there's a bigger thing at play here, and that's what we're actually fighting against. That's what we're actually competing against at level five. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can see why it wouldn't, it, there's not a lot of people that fall in five because you have to have an entire infrastructure behind you. You have to have an entire group of people at four before you can even qualify to be at five. And you've had to go through all these levels to get there. Right. Exactly. So five is not something that is like the end goal. I would actually say that from my perspective and what I got from the book is that four is really your goal. Four is the sweet spot to be. And then you peek into five at times, like you mentioned, when you're working on a major project. There probably are some companies that stay at five. I don't know how that works. And they probably are amazing to work for. Um, and and I know that you and I have peeked into five at some, you know, certain times when we've worked on certain projects where it's all about the project. I don't think it's long-term sustainable, but I don't think it needs to be. Four is a beautiful place to be. <laughs> Four is just great. <laughs> so what I love about this model is that not only does it help us figure out sort of where we're at, right? Like where's our morale? What is the morale we're bringing to the table? Are we a three? And we thought we were like the person who had the highest morale in the room, but actually we're out for our own personal competition. Or are we fours where we really want the team to succeed? And it's all about the tribe and it's all about these triads and and core values and company culture. Like where exactly do we fit? And then what's our step to get to the next phase, right? Like how are we going to alter our stories, our narratives around the company, or at least our story and narrative in the the team that we're in? How are we going to make sure that we're putting ourselves or saturating ourselves in uplifting morale boosting language and galvanizing the team and creating core values and making sure that we're all in integrity and alignment with it? I just think it's a really fantastic model for getting everybody up to that place where they really feel that they can do big stuff and then getting a group together to make those big things happen. And I think this really, like we've talked about earlier, this applies more than just the business. And we used a sports metaphor. We've talked about, you know, maybe family relationships. You've got a family dynamic going on. What tribal level is your family, your immediate family or extended family at? Uh, the people you interact with in the social group, maybe at your church or synagogue or uh, different places like this. Where are the tribal levels of these people? And and I think that clarifying question is, who am I competing with? Mm. Is really a clarifying question to realize what level you're at. Yeah, totally. Yeah, special interest groups. I mean, basically, you look around everywhere and people are just naturally organically creating tribes. So what is the, the level of the tribe you want to be at? And can you be a leader in the tribe? Can you be somebody who encourages people to get to the next level where maybe not only themselves individually, but everybody would be happier and you can actually make stuff happen, right? Like even in these special interest groups, can we make a big thing happen? Can we get something, you know, a, a major goal accomplished, even if it is just a special interest groups around, I don't know, like horses <laughs> or whatever it is. So the, I guess the thing I would say is because there's a large percentage of people at tribal three, which is I'm great. And by definition, everybody else is not as great or they suck at the worst. I, I would, if I was sitting here listening as a level three to this conversation and you, you're listening right now, I don't know what level you're at, but let's just assume you you might be at a level three. I think what I would take away from this is I would start to feel bad that I wasn't as developed as I should be. Like, well, I am in competition. I do want to go up the corporate ladder and am I wrong for being at this level? Am I wrong for being at level three right now in my life? And I would I would argue that no, you're not wrong. That's a, that's a valid place to be and it's a valid level to have to go through. And there are lessons you will learn there that you have to learn there in order to go up to the next level. So don't think that you're less than if you're at any of these levels or more than if you're at any of these levels. They're not necessarily, uh, they don't have necessarily a morality to them, I would say. 
it's more about just, it's a descriptor of where you are focused right now in your career or your life or the social group you're part of or whatever else. And the question to ask is, what is the healthier level or what's the next place we can go to increase, you know, increase the the positivity of all of this. Yeah. And what environment am I looking for to plug myself into if I want to get to the next level? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think? We'd like to hear from you. You can find us over at personalityhacker.com and make a comment under this podcast. Let us know what level you think you're at on the tribal leadership model. Uh, does this resonate with you? Have you noticed people in your company, business, you know, other places you've been in life? What levels are they at? Have you seen this show up? And have you noticed yourself going through these levels in your life? And how has that happened for you? We'd love to hear from you. Obviously, personalityhacker.com. You can also find us on our growing community over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes and multiple Android platforms. And please feel free to leave a review and rating on iTunes because they're very delightful to read. Absolutely. And if you know somebody who would really benefit from this podcast, you could share it with. They would really resonate with it. I'd like to personally invite you to share that with your friend or family member. And we'd love to be introduced to them and have them a part of this every week as well, this conversation around growing ourselves as people. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We'll talk to you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. <laughs>